Good evening, friends, and it's always a pleasure connecting with Mr. S. R. Somashekhar, a former district judge from Bangalore. And as we all know, that his all sessions, especially on the Beyond Law CLC, are taken on a different leap and are newly accepted. And today's session can also be gauged from the fact we received so many messages on the WhatsApp saying that we should add them in the WhatsApp group of the Beyond Law as well as on the Telegram group. And though the today's topic is appreciation of civil uh, of evidence in civil cases, but before we take leap and a deep dive into this, I can say that the way Sir appreciates the evidence and the audience at large appreciates the way he takes knowledge is a facet to be learnt, and the way he takes the analytical analysis of the Bear Acts and thereafter to the case law series is a different perspective, which actually people all that we should also learn the manner in which he takes. And despite the Sunday, and as usual, when we say that his son and daughter-in-law are an important pillar for his being there to share the knowledge. And we can only say that everyone should remain blessed because of their effort to pay back to the society, which we all say that just like corporate social responsibility. I think Mr. Somashekhar has taken the legal social responsibility that becomes the LSR for today. And I would request, sir, to share his knowledge. Over to you. Good evening, friends. I once again thank Mr. Vikas Chatrat for having given me one more opportunity. It was uh, more than three months. On the last occasion we discussed was in the month of July, 3 7, 2022. It is more than three and a half months. Now, Lawyers and judges are used to this expression frequently in the courts. How that question is relevant, how this evidence is relevant. Therefore, they always speak in terms of relevancy. Therefore, the subject that we discuss also should be relevant to their working. Only one or two judicial officers are here, maybe others might join. But the majority of the audience comprises of lawyers. It is the judge who appreciates the evidence and writes a judgment, be it a civil case or a criminal case. How then is the subject relevant for a lawyer is the question. The answer is very simple. Your opponent tells the court, that the evidence of your party or your client and his witness is unbelievable for a, for a particular reason. The document which you rely upon cannot be looked into for some reason. It is not proved, not admissible, some contentions are raised. You have to convince the court that the evidence of your witness or client is certainly reliable, would be accepted by the court. It can be believed. It is believable. The document is duly approved. It is admissible in evidence. Therefore, it could be looked into by the court. Similarly, when you argue an appeal, appearing for the appellant, you have to satisfy or convince the appellate court where the trial court went wrong in disbelieving your witness. Similarly, appearing for the respondent, you will have to tell the court that the trial court was perfectly right in disbelieving the evidence of the apparent opponent and believe in the evidence of my client. Therefore, the subject of appreciation of evidence is not irrelevant to the lawyers, though, as I said, it is the judge who ultimately appreciates the evidence. Now, the subject which I have chosen is appreciation of evidence in civil cases. It is a subject which is dear to my heart. And uh, there is some indication from Vitas Chetrat also about this. And ultimately, we came to the conclusion that this should be the title. Now, one basic principle which the evidence act itself will not tell us, but jurists thought that the standard of proof in a civil case and in a criminal case should be different. If you read the provisions of the Evidence Act, that principle cannot be known. 
in civil cases it is preponderance of probabilities while in a criminal case the prosecution has to establish the charges beyond all reasonable doubt today we are discussing only about civil cases preponderance of probabilities what it is you get an indication of it in section 3 of the evidence act which uh, gives the definitions of three important terms proved disproved and not proved i will just take up the word proved and that itself is sufficient to explain this concept a fact is said to be proved when after considering the matters before it the court either believes it to exist or considers its existence so probable that a prudent man ought under the circumstances of the particular case to act upon the supposition that it exists two things emerge from this a prudent man under the circumstances says that the existence of that fact is so probable therefore a judge deciding a case should appreciate the evidence as a prudent man what does that mean where does it take us if instead of coming to the court the parties who have a dispute approach a prudent man in their village that prudent man does not know the rules of evidence contained in the evidence act or any decision let us take one or two situations and we will understand what it means a simple suit for recovery of money the other a has lent money a say claims to have lent money to b b disputes it all right they decide let us go to that prudent man in the village and see who is right and who is wrong the prudent man uses his common sense and says well this a himself had borrowed money from me about a year back and i am given to understand that he has borrowed money from several people when he himself is impoverished where is the question of he lending money to b it is highly improbable that he would have lent a money to b on the other hand he may also say well well b also had approached me to advance a sum of rupees 10 lakhs i am given to understand that he had approached several other persons recently he performed the marriage of his daughter he got his son admitted to a prestigious school one of his family members was was ailing and he spent a good lot of money on treatment so it is quite likely that he had a need for money he has not read the evidence set he does not know the presumptions under the negotiable instrument set he does not know on whom the burden lies as a prudent man he comes to a conclusion it is quite probable that a might have lent or b might have borrowed or the other ways let us take a suit for specific performance the familiar defense appears to be throughout the country at least in karnataka it is very rare that the defense is very popular the defendant wanted loan he knew that the plaintiff was a money lender had enough money to lend on several occasions he had lent money to several other persons he went to the plaintiff and asked him to finance him the plaintiff told him why well, i prepared to lend provided you execute a document in the nature of an agreement of sale as security for the loan the document reads like an agreement of sale but according to the defendant the intended transaction was a loan transaction and not a sale transaction whether that a, such a plea is barred by the provisions of section 92 of the evidence act is altogether a different uh, matter about which if an occasion arises we will discuss on some other day but as of now we will go to a prudent man and let us see how he examines this well this plaintiff will assure that because before the prudent man it is no plaintiff and defendant a and b will put it 
well ye had come to me saying he wanted to buy a land he asked me whether there is any per, any person who is willing to send sell his land he had gone to several persons intending to buy a land so it is quite possible that he really intended to buy the land similarly when it comes to b he may say as i gave the same example he had some need for money he had to raise money by sending by selling his property his wife is ill he is also ill his children are all settled in a city they want to leave the village sell their land and they want to settle in the village it is quite probable that he intended to sell the land on the other hand he may also come to the conclusion i know that the only land he has is this he has got deep roots in the village it is unlikely that he intended to sell his only land as far as this a is concerned well he has lent money to several persons maybe to b also he had lent money and took this document so it is quite probable that it is not a sale transaction but it is only a loan transaction a suit for partition of joint family properties the one defense which is usually taken is that some of the properties are self acquisitions these parties got a prudent man he says the father of the parties was a lazy man sufficiently ill he was addicted to vices he was not working at all it is quite unlikely that he would have financed his son to purchase a valuable property worth 20 lakhs on the other hand i know this boy even as a college going student he was working in some shop he was giving tuition he he was a very pro i mean a a very studious boy he was working he is employed he is not even married he has saved some money it is quite possible that he has contributed from his own funds and i rule out the probability of the property having been acquired from out of joint family funds on the other hand if he comes to a conclusion that it is probable that it is a joint family property he may say well the joint family has about 5 had it for 5 acres of wet land their father was a very enthusiastic person even at that age he was going to the land taking care of it on the other hand this boy who says that he has purchased from his funds was hardly 20 years of age he was a lazy boy moving around the town he was not doing any work it is unlikely that funds generated from him for purchase of this valuable land it is improbable now when a judge appreciates evidence see that section again proved a fact is said to be proved when after considering the matters before it the court either believes it to exist or considers its existence so probable that a prudent man ought under the circumstances of the particular case to act upon the supposition that it exists if a prudent man accepts that fact as probable then the judge also has to say it is probable therefore while appreciating evidence the judge should also resort to the standard of a prudent man but then what is this difference or distinction that prudent man is not governed by the provisions of section 6 to 55 of the evidence act which speak about facts which are relevant nor is he bound by the provisions of part 2 of the evidence act which tell us as to how a fact is to be proved but for a judge he is bound by this well when he comes to a conclusion that it is probable that this fact existed it is probable that the plaintiff lent money it is probable that it is a joint family property it is probable that it is not an agreement to sell but it is only a loan transaction for him to come to such a conclusion the facts placed on record should be strictly within relevant facts covered by part 1 of the evidence act 
those facts will have to be strictly proved as provided in part two of the evidence set. As all of you know, evidence set, preliminary chapter dealing with some important definitions. And thereafter, it is divided into three parts. First part deals with relevancy of facts. The second part, proof of facts. Third part, production and effect of evidence. I often tell the title given to the first two parts is quite appropriate. But somehow the title given to the third part is not all that appropriate. It does not really reflect the contents of the various provisions there. Leave it. Anyway, effect of evidence, it is the judge who has to consider the effect of that evidence. So therefore, as lawyers and as judicial officers, what you need to know is whether the evidence placed on record is relevant. Just go through the definition of the word relevant given in the evidence site. One fact is said to be relevant to another when the one is connected with the other in any of the ways referred to in the provisions of the SAT relating to the relevancy of facts. Straight away go to section 5. Evidence may be given in any suit or proceeding of the existence or non-existence of every fact in issue and of such other facts as are herein after declared to be relevant and of no others. See the stress there. The Evidence Act has declared certain facts to be relevant. Section 5 doesn't stop there. It says, I have declared by this Act, the Evidence Act has declared that certain facts are relevant and the court is prohibited from receiving evidence of facts which I have not declared as relevant. However intelligent a judge may be, however intelligent a lawyer may be, I am above you. Be you ever so high, law is above you. I am above you. I have declared by this through this act, only these facts are relevant. Please be careful. As of here and after, declared to be relevant and of no others, it has not stopped there. See this stress there, as I am now doing, as to be of relevant and of no others. Therefore, the judge is constrained, prevented, injuncted, restrained by the provisions of Section 5 of the Evidence Act to take on record any fact which the Evidence Act has not declared to be relevant. Which are those facts which the Evidence Act has declared to be relevant? They are covered by Section 6 to 55. Having regard to the title of the subject given to me and the time at my disposal, I will not be able to tell you in detail about the provisions of Section 6 to 55. I will only, for those who are uninitiated and novice, I will just tell you as to how you should go about it. It has to be read in groups. Section 6 to 16, they form one group. 17 to 31, the title is admissions. Generally, we say admissions and confessions. 32 and 33, the third group. 34 to 39 is the fourth group. That is then statements of courts of justice when relevant, sections 40 to 44. Opinion evidence, 45 to 51. Then character evidence, 52 to 55. So therefore, I repeat, a lawyer who argues the matter before the court should say, well, there is evidence. There is only volume. There is no quality. The evidence that is placed by the opponent is certainly not covered by any of these provisions. It is totally irrelevant. There is only volume, but no quality. The other side has to say, well, I will point out how it is relevant. Of course, it is a big exercise. We will leave it at that stage. Then, what is this preponderance then? There is some oral evidence and documentary evidence on the side of the plaintiff. Similarly, there is some evidence on the side of the defendant. The court has to put them in a balance. We will have to see where the weight is, which pan goes below. If the pan on which the evidence of the plaintiff is put goes below, then the case of the plaintiff is more probable than the case of the defendant. This is what we say when we deal with uh, this uh, temporary injunction, the concept of balance of convenience. 
the inconvenience caused to the plaintiff if an order of temporary injunction is not granted is put on one pack the inconvenience that is caused to the defendant by granting an order of temporary injunction is put on the other pack see which pack goes below in fact uh, even two or three days back i was telling someone that there is a place called chikbalapur in karnataka there the lawyers were saying balance of inconvenience not balance of convenience you will have to examine who will be put to more inconvenience when an injunction is granted or not granted leave it as it is therefore whose case is more probable but when it comes to a criminal case as i told you in the beginning and as most of you may be knowing the charge against the accused will have to be proved beyond all reasonable doubt what is that all reasonable doubt what is that reasonable doubt let's say uh, different uh, concept altogether let us not bring that in here bring that here then the next important thing which you should bear in mind is as lawyers we have one basic principle any amount of evidence without a plea cannot be looked into by the court therefore lawyers of this generation they put evidence also in the pleadings because there is a bar which says that no amount of evidence can be looked into without a pleading not knowing it perhaps they put that evidence also in the pleading on an earlier occasion I have drawn your attention to order six saying that pleading should contain only facts and material facts and not evidence i am only refreshing your memory in that regard so when you try to place evidence on record that evidence should be related to the case of the plaintiff or the defendant any evidence which is not born out of plea which is not related to the pleadings is of no value is of absolutely no value then there is another concept called variance between pleading and evidence first rule is no amount of evidence without pleading is of no avail either to the plaintiff or to the defendant the second uh, concept is variance between pleadings and proof something is pleaded something is proved some other evidence is given i have seen this in many cases particularly in suits for partition in the plaint it is stated that the properties are ancestral properties or they were the self acquisition so they deceased maybe a woman or a man whatever it is during the course of evidence some document is produced indicating that they were ancestral properties in the cross examination a suggestion is made the plaintiff admits that there is ancestral properties this is this generally happens like this therefore you will have to be careful as lawyers to see that any evidence you place on record does not vary with the plea of course whether your client stands the test of cross examination which stands the test of cross examination is a different aspect of the matter whether the case put forward by the affidavit is true or false it is ultimately for the judge to decide it is for you to convince whether it could be accepted or rejected but the care that you will have to take is well when you put your client to the witness box for purpose of cross examination you should tell him this is your case this is the likely suggestions that are to be put be consistent in your stand of course there may be other factors which the uh, which may come in the way of witness maybe he gets confused and all that leave all that but you have got a duty to tell your client well this is your case this is the case of the opponent you must stick to your case therefore even when you draft the plaint before you draft the plaint or the written statement take clear instructions from the client look to the documents that they have produced and let the case you stand or fall on that uh, particular uh, case that you have pleaded be clear about this then there is one concept called burden of proof and onus of proof evidence that does not by itself tell you what this onus of proof is it only refers to burden of proof 
please go to part three of the evidence that commencing from section 101 whoever desires any court to give judgment as to any legal right or liability dependent on the existence of facts which he asserts must prove that those facts exist when a person is bound to prove the existence of any fact it is said that the burden of proof lies on that person illustration here relates to a criminal case i am avoiding p a desires to a desires the court to give a judgment that he is entitled to certain land in the possession of b by reason of which he asserts and which b denies to be true a must prove the existence of those facts a suit for declaration of title and possession or a suit for possession based on title so plaintiff says i am the owner of the property defendant is in unlawful possession or he has dispossessed me give me back that possession because he is denying my title also declare that i am the owner of the property the defendant denies that the plaintiff is the owner therefore the burden is on the plaintiff to show that he is the owner of the property so there is a basic thing whoever asserts a positive fact must prove it then 102 the burden of proof in a suit or proceeding lies on that person who would fail if no evidence at all were given on either side uh, whatever be the illustration given here i will give a simple example for that plaintiff files a suit for recovery of rent defendant admits that he is a tenant he admits the rate of rent he pleads i have paid the entire rent nothing is due he asserts a positive fact saying that he has paid everything plaintiff cannot be called upon to prove a negative saying that uh, defendant has not paid the rent it is sufficient if he rebuts that evidence therefore if no evidence is given the plaintiff will succeed a simple suit for partition let us not go to section 6 of the hindu succession act leave it a simple case covered by section 8 of the hindu succession act a hindu father dies leaving behind his class one years one of them files a suit for partition against others they admit the relationship they admit that the father died interstate they say that the father has left behind a bill bequeathing the properties to them and therefore they have become the owners what is there for the plaintiff to prove in this case if the defendants do not give evidence plaintiff will certainly succeed it is the defendant who fails in the suit on the other hand in the earlier case when the defendant denies the title of the plaintiff if the plaintiff does not give evidence to show that he has got title the plaintiff will fail then 103 the burden of proof as to any particular fact lies on that person who wishes the court to believe in its existence unless it is provided by any law that the proof of that fact shall lie on any particular person a suit for partition of joint family properties the presumption under hindu law is that the properties continue to be joined the presumption is that and it is for he who says that there is a partition defendants admit the nature of the properties it is true that they are joint family properties they also admit the genealogy given in the plaint they say that there is a partition who has to prove it because there is a presumption under hindu law that the properties continue to be joined plaintiff takes no burden it is the defendant who has to prove it please go to order 18 rule 1 cpc if by any chance you have the cpc with you or 18 rule 1 the plaintiff has the right to begin unless the defendant admits the facts alleged by the plaintiff and contends that either in point of law or on some additional facts alleged by the defendant the plaintiff is not entitled to any part of the relief which he asks for in which case the defendant has the right to begin this is a case where the defendant has to begin because he sets up a prior partition it is for him to do in the other case i said plaintiff files a suit for recovery of rent defendant admits that he is a tenant defendant admits the rate of rent 
He says that he has paid the entire rent, nothing is due. The burden is on the defendant. The case will have to be posted for defendant's evidence. It is the defendant who gets the right, uh, right to begin. Then we have a presumption under section 118 of the Negotiable Instruments Act. One of the presumptions is that every negotiable instrument is drawn for consideration. As all of you know, pro note, check, and bill of exchange are considered to be negotiable instruments. I am to see a case where a bill of exchange or a bill of exchange is suit is filed. In case of pro notes and checks, they are the usual suits that are filed. The plaintiff need only establish the execution of the document. If the plaintiff says that the defendant borrowed from him a particular sum of money and executed a suit pro note, proof pro note, or gave a check and the defendant denies it, the first issue is whether the plaintiff proves that the defendant has executed the suit pro note or has issued the check in question. Plaintiff need not prove that he lent money. Issue cannot be listed whether the plaintiff proves that the defendant borrowed some a particular sum of money from him or he lent that money. Because there is a presumption under 118 of the Negotiable Instruments Act that every negotiable instrument is drawn for consideration. The first issue is whether the plaintiff proves the execution of the suit promissory note, whether he proves that the defendant issued the suit check. Second issue, if so, does the defendant prove that it is not supported by consideration? In fact, I see some at least two officers from Karnataka on the screen. They have heard me in the Judicial Academy and uh, I have drawn their attention to number of judgments of the Karnataka High Court on this point. Judges of yester years have written those judgments saying that in a suit on an on-demand promissory note, the issue is whether the plaintiff proves the execution of the suit pro note. There is no need for the plaintiff to prove that loan amount was also, I mean, money was also lent by him to the defendant. So these are certain presumptions. It is not, it is not for the judge who frames issues. We should have a knowledge of this. Lawyers also should know it. Appearing for the plaintiff, when the court frames an issue casting the burden on your client to prove not only the passing of consideration and also execution of the document, you should bring to the notice of the court there is a presumption under 180. I am liable, I am, my burden is only to show the execution of the promissory note. It is the defendant who takes the burden to show that it is not supported by consideration. Suit is for partition. Defendant pleads a prior partition. The court frames an issue whether the plaintiff proves that the suit properties are giant family properties. You will have to tell the court there is a presumption under Hindu law that the properties continue to be joined. It is for he who says that there is a partition to prove it. Therefore, you now see that this uh, stated, I mean, uh, what issues have to be framed on whom the burden is to be cast is not just for the judge. It is for the lawyers also to assist the court and also see that their claims are not unnecessarily burdened and they need not take a burden which the law does not give them. So please be clear in this regard. Therefore, the concept of this burden of proof is not altogether irrelevant for the lawyers also. I told you that onus of proof is something which the evidence said does not make a reference. Well, if you go to a dictionary, you don't find any different meaning for that. Bonus and burden, they give the same thing. But in law, there is a difference. Judges have found out a difference. The concept is a bit difficult to understand, but I will give you one or two examples. Then you will be able to understand this. Burden of proof and bonus of proof. Before that, one concept requires to be known. What is this burden of proof? Judges tell, I mean, the Supreme Court has said that the burden of proof has also two meanings. One, the burden of establishing a case and the burden of leading evidence. Burden of proof has two shapes. One, burden of establishing a case, burden of leading evidence. 
you will have to lead evidence and you will have to establish it that is that burden this is ar 1960 supreme court 100 these are all old decisions i know but they have laid down the law in very clear terms ar 1960 supreme court 100 distinction between burden of proof and one of I mean, not distinction two shades of this expression burden of proof burden of proving the case establishing the case and burden of leading evidence then what is this uh, difference between burden and onus? AER 1964 Supreme Court 136. AER 1964 Supreme Court 136. What the Supreme Court has said, probably I believe it is Justice Garyan, the judge in statement says, burden remains safe, throw, uh, burden remains constant throughout whereas onus oscillates as the evidence progresses it oscillates the concept is a bit difficult for those who are still in the beginning of the profession gray hair should be able to appreciate this burden remains constant onus oscillates shifts from time to time Many times, what happens is this. I have seen this. Plaintiff sets up some title. He says that he has purchased the property from Mr. X. Defendant denies it. In the cross examination, a question is asked to the plaintiff. You say that the property belongs, you say that the, you purchased the property from X. Did you verify the title deeds of X? Did you satisfy yourself that X had title to the property? Yes, I satisfied myself. Is a clear answer. I satisfied myself and therefore I bought it. The liar's key point. There is nothing to show that X was having title to the property. Have you challenged it by a further uh, suggestion in the cross examination? What documents you verify to, I mean, have further questioned him which document you verified to know that X had title? Have you suggested to him that X had no title at all? If the suggestion is that I put it to you that X had no title, then again, the owner shifts to the plaintiff. Burden is already there. Issue is frame saying that the plaintiff proves that he is the owner of the suit schedule property. During the course of evidence from stage to stage, owners goes on shifting. He says that the property belonged to X. Did you verify how X got title? Yes, I verified. Finish. You must further suggest to him, if at all it is your case that X was also not the owner and therefore he could not have conveyed one to the plaintiff, you must suggest that X was not the owner. Then the owner shifts to the plaintiff to produce some document or give some evidence to show that X had the title to the property. Are you following what I am telling? This is appreciation of evidence. I have seen lawyers arguing. Well, the plaintiff says that he has purchased the property from X. Where is any document to show that X was the owner? Have you disputed it? What is it that you have elicited? Did you verify at the time of purchasing the property that X was its owner? Yes, I verified. Is there a further question to him which document you produced? Is there a further question, suggestion that X did not own the property at all? In the absence of such a suggestion, I am the hundred, I mean, I am fully confident that the plaintiff lawyer need not go to the extent or go to the, uh, of course, if he wants to still be certain and produce document, no problem. Even if he does not do it, certainly he should be able to convince the court and the judicial officer should accept his stand that X was the owner. Then let me proceed further. All right, plaintiff says that I verified. Defendant lawyer also asks, what is it that you verified? Well, they, I, I went through, I, I made inquiries in the office of the sub I took an encumbrance certificate. He also gave me the title deed and all. 
Did he also give you the title, the, his title deeds when you purchase the property? Yes, I got it. And then the lawyers will ask, have you produced it? Is there, if it is there, if it is already there. And we judges are also used to this type of questions. We also don't, uh, because if we say it is not there, it will not be there, but lawyers will not be satisfied. They want, uh, they, they think that we read only the documents and not oral evidence. And therefore they insist on recording this answer. We have also been doing it. All right, I have not produced it. Next question is, do you have any impediment to produce? A very relevant question. He says, I have no impediment to produce. Then an adverse inference has to be drawn against him. Supposing he says that he has seen that document, that document, the title deed of yes was also given to him. He does not produce it, draw an adverse inference. Now there is that onus on him to produce that document. That is why Justice Dajan Rajatkar in the judgment beautifully says, burden remains constant. Onus is a shifting thing. It takes place continuously during the course of evaluation of evidence. Now, when I say this burden remains constant, what does it mean? The issue is already framed, casting the burden on the, or the plaintiff or on the defendant to prove a particular fact asserted by him or her. As and when the trial goes on, as I said, the owner shifts depending upon the suggestions made, the admissions obtained, the denials obtained, the owner shifts. Merely because the owner shifts, the court cannot go on recasting the issues. Uh, now there is evidence to say that the plaintiff purchased the property from X. Plaintiff has stated in his evidence that yeah, he were confirmed that X had title to the property. Therefore, the owner shifts to the defendant. Therefore, I will reframe the issue casting the burden of the defendant. That cannot be done. That is why burden remains constant till the judgment is pronounced. It is the onus that shifts and it certainly requires some experience. Uh, for a lawyer, uh, what, what is to be elicited, what is to be argued, certainly it requires experience. And uh, uh, junior lawyers will read some earlier judgments. Here, senior counsel argued the matter, cross examining. Here, some uh, lectures and all that, thereby equip themselves. Judicial officers also, in the beginning, they also have this difficulty in appreciating evidence. Over the years, they would be able to make it up. So, this I believe that I have discharged my burden of explaining to you the concept of this burden of proof and onus. If I have now the onus is on you now. Then there is one other principle which you should bear in mind. When both parties have let evidence, when both parties have let evidence, burden of proof pales into insignificance. It is of no consequence. That burden of proof assumes significance at the time of framing the issues. At the time of framing the issues, you do not know whether the plaintiff admits or the defendant admits. Based on the assertions made in the plaint and the denials in the written statement or admissions in the written statement, issues are framed by the court. You cast the, the issues, the burden is cast either on the plaintiff or the defendant. Now, Assume a case where the burden of proving all the issues is on the plaintiff. Burden of proving all the issues is on the plaintiff. Does it mean that the defendant should not lead any evidence to rebut the case of the plaintiff? Does it mean that the defendant is prevented from leading evidence on his side to rebut the evidence of the plaintiff? Does it mean that the defendant should not produce any document? Therefore, even in a case where the burden of proving all the issues is on the plaintiff, experience has shown defendant also gives evidence at least to probabilize his case. And I am sure in your experience, at least in one case, an issue would have been framed casting the burden on the defendant also. Though he might not have set up a counterclaim. Though he may not have sought any relief, there is an issue on him. Take a very usual case of plaintiff seeking a declaration of title, defendant uh, setting up adverse possession. The issue is on the burden is on the defendant to prove that he has perfected his title by adverse possession. 
when you examine whether the plaintiff has established his title, uh, when the court examines that, the court has to necessarily examine the stand of the defendant, whether he has perfected his title by adverse possession. Both parties are letting evidence. Plaintiff has produced a document saying that they establish his title. They establish his possession. He produces some revenue records and all that. He examines a few witnesses. Defendant also produces some documents. Defendant also produces some oral evidence, produces oral evidence. The court cannot shut its eyes to the evidence of the defendant saying the burden is on the plaintiff. Uh, there is uh, one familiar argument advanced in the courts. Plaintiff has come to the court. He has to stand on his legs. He can't take advantage of the weakness of the defendant. They are all very general propositions. I jocularly tell there are some occasions where the plaintiff can relax. When the defendant has to stand on his legs, plaintiff can sit and relax for some time. These are all general propositions. There are exceptions to every general rule. If it is an absolute proposition that the plaintiff has come to the court, he has to stand on his legs. Why any issue should be framed casting any burden on the defendant to prove any issue? Why issues at all should be framed? Why the issues are framed? To know what the burden of each party is. Why the defendant should lead evidence? See, basic rule is, well, the plaintiff has come to the court, he has to make out a case true. But when both the parties have let in evidence, can the court set its size to the evidence given by the defendant? There it is said, at the time of writing judgment or appreciating evidence, that burden of proof that burden which you have placed on the plaintiff or the defendant at the time of framing the issues does not assume significance when the court evaluates evidence. It has to take into consideration the evidence placed by both the parties, the documents placed by, on record by both the parties. So this is a, a principle when both parties have led evidence, burden of proof fails into insignificance. AAR 1964 Supreme Court 880. AAR 1964 Supreme Court 880. And a fairly recent one. AAR 1999 Supreme Court 3216. AAR 1999 Supreme Court 3216. That decision is also reported in SCC 19, 1999. 1999. Volume 4 SCC 350. 350. Then, on some earlier occasion in this very platform, I had explained this concept of judicial admissions and evidentiary admissions. Evidentiary admissions are covered by sections 17 to 31 found in part one of the evidence act relating to relevancy. Judicial admissions are contained in section 58, which is in the second part. First, let me refer to this judicial admission. Please go to section 58 of the evidence act. Section 58 of the evidence act. Facts admitted need not be proved. No fact need be proved in any proceeding which the parties thereto or their agents agree to admit at the hearing or which before the hearing they agree to admit by any writing under their hands or which by any rule of pleading in force at the time they are deemed to have admitted by their pleadings. Proviso I leave it for the time being. I remember that when I spoke about R8, then Order 11 discovery had told this. Facts admitted need not be proved. Which are those facts? If you read Section 58 very carefully, it would indicate what is admitted in the pleading need not be proved. Admissions in pleadings are called judicial admissions. They need not be proved. I will elaborate it a little later. First, know the concept. I will give an illustration later. First, let us know the concept. Admissions in pleadings need not be proved. They are the admissions referred to here. We are saying 
lawyers arguing admitted he reads the cross examination of the plaintiff or the defendant it is true to suggest something your honor with your honor's rich experience you know admitted facts need not be proved that is not what is contemplated by section 58 the admission referred to in section 58 i am repeating please let it register in your mind it is a judicial admission that is made in the pleading then the commentary and the evidence had to tell us there is another kind of admission answers given to interrogatories delivered under order 11 interrogatories delivered under order 11 i had told you in detail what this interrogatory is again take a suit for partition defendants say that there are some self acquisitions they may deliver interrogatories to the plaintiff do you admit that this particular defendant was an employee in a bank do you admit that he was a lecturer in a college do you admit uh, that he was running a computer center and was earning so much of money if those things are admitted then they are admissions on record judicial admissions means admissions made during the course of judicial proceeding after the matter has reached the judiciary there is an admission there that is why they are called judicial admissions one admissions in pleadings secondly admissions in answers to interrogatories delivered under order 11 the third kind of admission is admission made in response to a notice issued under order 12 rule 8 and order 12 rule 8 they are called judicial admissions the supreme court has said that judicial admissions can be the foundation of rights the court can safely act upon those judicial admissions whereas evidentiary admissions will have to be brought during through the medium of evidence parties will have to be asked in the cross examination will have to be asked during the course of trial the they are called evidentiary admissions covered by section 17 to 31 commencing from 24 up to 31 they relate to 30 they relate to criminal cases 17 to 23 and 31 they relate to a civil case to please now see section 31 admissions are not conclusive proof of the facts admitted but they may operate as estoppels under the provisions herein after herein after can take so therefore if our opponent says takes out or some evidence of the plaintiff or the defendant says he has admitted my lord your honor admitted facts need not be proved these evidentiary admissions can be explained the explanation that your client gives may be true or not the court may accept it or may not accept it that is a different aspect of the matter they are not conclusive by themselves they only operate as estoppels is what section 31 of the evidence act says so section 17 to 21 and 31 they relate 17 to 23 and 31 they relate to civil cases 24 to 30 they relate to criminal cases we usually say them as confession now we have a series of judgments of the supreme court which you will quickly make a note of in this regard ar 1960 supreme court 100 AR 1960 Supreme Court 100, AR 1966 Supreme Court 405, AR 1966 Supreme Court 405, AR 1967 Supreme Court 341, AR 1967 Supreme Court 341, AR 1974 Supreme Court 117, AR 1974 Supreme Court 117. AR 1974 Supreme Court 471, AR 1974 Supreme Court 471, then AR 1977 Supreme Court 1724. Now some explanation is required here. Now I will give you two examples because they are the cases which usually come with the trial courts. you may i may be excused because i always give examples from suits for specific performance and partition suits because uh, they are the best examples to be given to bring home the facts very clearly i told you in a suit for specific performance the familiar defense at least as far as the state of karnataka is concerned is true that the defendant has executed an agreement of sale but it was intended to be a security for the loan borrowed from the plaintiff 
and there was no intention on the part of the defendant to execute a sale date. As I have already told you, whether such a plea can be taken in the face of section 92 is a different matter. Supreme Court has said that such a plea is permissible. Let us not uh, divert our attention to this. Now, what is admitted here? There is a clear admission of the execution of the agreement of sale. Signature or thumb mark of the defendant of the document is admitted. He does not dispute the execution of the document. He does not dispute the title given to that document. He does not dispute the contents of that document. What he says is that the transaction was in, in, which was intended was altogether different. This was not the transaction we intended. For this purpose, this document was styled like this. The recitals were like this. Such a plea, the Supreme Court has said, is permissible. It is not barred by Section 92 of the Evidence Act. Now, there is this clear admission of the execution of the agreement of sale. It is a judicial admission covered by Section 58. Unwittingly, or not having prepared himself, or not having gone through the written statement, or not knowing the concept very clearly, or only to put some question to the defendant. The plaintiff lawyer says, it is your signature. You have executed this exhibit P1. Defendant is also fed up because his lawyer would have instructed any document which is shown to you, you deny. Any signature that is shown to you, you deny. Just as when an accused is examined under 313 CRPC, the instructions are that you should say false. PW2 is your wife. I do not know, he says. This is how uh, the uh, uh, statement under 313. So the defendant also gets fed up. Anything that is shown to him, he goes on denying. Then the defendant liars argues. Your Honor will see in the cross examination of the defendant. My learned counsel confronted exhibit P1. My client denied it. He confronted exhibit P1A, suggested to him that it is his signature. My client has denied it. Plaintiff has not examined the attestor. He has not taken the services of the handwriting expert. Don't get unnerved by such submissions. You should tell the court there is a judicial admission in the written statement about the execution of the document. Execution is not in dispute. Signature is not in dispute. The title given to the document is not in dispute. The recitals are not in dispute. The case of the defendant is that the transaction intended was altogether different, but the recitals show that it is only an agreement of sale. This is judicial admission. Did you follow this? In a suit for partition, as I said, Defendants admit that the suit properties are joint family property, or at least at one point of time. They say that there is already a partition. Right. Defendant is in the witness box. Unnecessarily, the plaintiff lawyer asks him, you see, item number one, it is your father's father's property, it is ancestral property. This man is fed up, no, I have purchased it. Where is the foundation for that? Then the defendant lawyer says, no, your honor will see. In the cross examination, my client has stated that it is his own property. What about the judicial admission made in the written statement that their ancestral properties are giant family properties and subsequently there is a division? So it is here that admitted facts need not be proved, them. not just reading some uh, cross examination. It is true to suggest that is not the admission contemplated by section 58. So please be clear about this. Then we have seen when we spoke about order six. Under order six rule four, particulars regarding fraud, misrepresentation, and other things will have to be specifically pleaded. It is somewhat an exception to rule two. Rule two says facts, material facts alone should be pleaded. The evidence should not be pleaded is what rule two says. But rule four of order six says. In all cases in which the party pleading, maybe the plaintiff or the defendant, relies on any misrepresentation, fraud, breach of trust, willful default, or undue influence, 
and in all other cases in which the particulars may be necessary beyond such as are exemplified in the forms aforesaid, particulars with the dates and items, if necessary, shall be stated in the pleading. Now, a vague plea is stated in the plaintiff or the written statement. If the plaintiff files a suit for cancellation of a document, he says that the defendant played fraud on him, there was undue influence, therefore, he executed that document, cancelled that document. Or the plaintiff files a suit for title, declaration of title on the basis of some gift deed or sale deed, said to have been executed by the defendant. Defendant says there was fraud on him, undue influence, pressure, coercion, therefore, he executed the document. When the plaintiff sues for cancellation of a document said to have been executed by him, or the defendant wants to non suit the plaintiff, saying that because of that pressure, he executed that document. What was that fraud that was committed? What was that misrepresentation that was made? What is that undue influence which he exercised? Well, those definitions are found in the contract at 15, coercion, 16, uh, undue influence, 17, fraud, 18, misrepresentation, all those things are there. Particulars will have to be given. Well, plaintiff has to say, well, defendant uh, took me to some office saying, I'll get the kata of your property changed to your name. Please put your signature. I'm an illiterate person. I do not know. I do not I have no knowledge of worldly affairs. I signed it. Later, it turned out to be that he has taken a gift deed from me or a sale deed from me. Similarly, the defendant might plead certain things. So, what exactly was the fraud played? How the fraud was played? What was that misrepresentation made? Mere use of the words that the document is a result of fraud and misrepresentation will not suffice. Therefore, when you argue a matter before the court, you must tell the judge that there is only a pleading. It is only during the course of trial he says something. And therefore, that cannot be looked into. So, particular in fraud and other things will have to be done. Then, while appreciating evidence, one thing, one other thing which assumes importance is presumptions. There are directory presumptions and mandatory presumptions under the evidence act and other enactments also. First, let us see what the evidence had to say, say about this. Carefully follow me when I read it. Observe the stress where I gave. Section 4. May presume. Whenever it is provided by this Act that the court may presume a fact, it may either regard such fact as proved unless and until it is disproved or may call for proof of it. See the expression used whenever it is provided by the act that the court may presume a fact. There are a host of sections commencing from 79 ending with 140 where the expression used is may. They are called directory presumptions. Facts referred to in those sections may be presumed or may not be presumed where it is provided by the fact that the court may presume the fact. The court may in its discretion presume that fact or may not presume. Of course, uh, it should be reasonable. And then whenever a discretion is given to the court, the discretion has to be exercised reasonably. That is a settled principle. Shall presume. See the four. Shall presume. Wherever it is directed by the fact. It may presume the word used is a little mild, wherever it is provided by this act. Shall presume, wherever it is directed by this act, it is the evidence that directs the court to do what? That the court shall presume a fact, it shall regard such fact as proved unless and until it is disproved. These are called mandatory presumptions. Again, as I said, from 79 to 140, in some sections, the word used is may, in some other sections, the word used is shall. In uh, some other platforms, uh, well, when the subject itself is taken, I have drawn the attention of the audience also to the relevant sections where the word may is used, where the shell is, where the shell is used. Time doesn't permit me to do that exercise. You do it on your own. So, if a particular section uses the word may, the fact referred to therein may be presumed by the court. It is called a discretionary presumption. But on the other hand, in those provisions or sections where the word shell is used, the facts referred to therein will have to be presumed by the court. 
that presumption may be in favor of the plaintiff or it may be in favor of the defendant. It is for the opponent to disprove that fact. Then conclusive proof. Then one fact is declared by this act to be conclusive proof of another. See how beautifully the words are used. It may presume whenever it is provided by this act. Stress is not there. Shall presume whenever it is directed by this act. The court shall presume it. When one fact is declared by this act, the evidence act has declared certain facts are conclusive proof. For your immediate reference, sections 41, 112, and 113 are three sections where the facts referred to therein are conclusive proof by themselves. Of course, uh, it does not go into those details. It is not the occasion for me to tell you that. Anyway, they are three sections where the expression conclusive proof facts referred to therein are conclusive proof. The other sections are this. Now, apart from the presumptions available under the evidence that we have got certain other statutory presumptions. As I have already told you, 118 of the negotiable instruments act. There are, I think, uh, some 118A to H or something, or 128, something of that kind. <coughs> Eight facts are referred to therein, which the court has to presume. One important thing is that every negotiable instrument is presumed to be drawn for consideration. It is presumed to have been drawn on the date mentioned in that document. These are all the usual presumptions. So apart from the presumptions mentioned in the evidence that when you argue a matter, you will have to draw the attention of the court to the specific pre presumptions available under the special enactments. As I said, one thing is NIAT. As far as uncodified Hindu law, as I said, at least thrice today itself, there is a presumption under the classic Hindu law that a property is joined. It is for this person who says that there is a partition to prove it. There is yet another presumption. When there is a partition, when the partition is admitted, it is a partition, total partition. Partition of all the properties belonging to the family, partition amongst all the shares. So he who pleads a partial partition will have to establish it. These are all settled uh, legal positions. So therefore, when you argue a matter, you should also draw the attention of the court to these presumptions and you will have to lead evidence keeping in view these presumptions. What is it that I am required to prove? Rather, what is it that my client is required to prove? What is it that the opponent is required to prove? What evidence he has given to rebut the presumption available under the act? Then, having the, drawn your attention to some provisions of the evidence act, let us see how the evidence of each witness needs to be appreciated. Different categories of witnesses and types of evidence. Number one, parties to the suit. When and to what extent corroboration is required. This is important. There cannot be hard and fast rule in this regard. First of all, go to section 134 of the Evidence Act. No particular number of witnesses shall, in any case, be required for the proof of any fact. The Evidence Act does not say that you should necessarily examine a witness in support of the case of the plaintiff or in support of the case of the defendant. The court can decree the suit based on the sole evidence of the plaintiff. The court can dismiss the suit based on the sole evidence of the defendant. There is no rule. Sometimes corroboration becomes necessary. When it becomes necessary. A suit where either the plaintiff sets up perfection of title by adverse possession or the defendant sets up title by adverse possession, probably Probably, capitally, depending upon the answers elicited in the cross examination, mere evidence of the plaintiff or the defendant may not be sufficient. The plea itself is perfection of title by adverse possession. There cannot be any document to evidence it. Necessarily, the party who sets up that plea has to examine someone to show that he is in possession of the property. 
as far as title is concerned, it is only documents. No amount of oral evidence, even if you bring 100 witnesses and tell that the plaintiff is the owner or the defendant is the owner, it cannot be accepted. Title in respect of an immobile property can only be established by documentary evidence. No corroboration will be required. Now, the plaintiff has filed a suit for permanent injunction. Well, the documents produced by him do not show his possession at all. They show the names of someone else or the name of the defendant. What is there for the defendant to establish in this case except enter in the witness box and say that he is in his possession? There is no need for the defendant's evidence to be corroborated here. On the other hand, the plaintiff may say, he may examine some neighbor saying, well, I have seen the plaintiff, he is cultivating this land, he is my neighbor, he is staying in that house, something of that kind. So therefore, the evidence of parties themselves could be accepted by the court. There are certain situations where the evidence of the plaintiff or the defendant needs corroboration. Now, a case of oral partition is set up. Certainly to prove that oral partition, the panchayatdars of the elders of the village who are present at the time the oral partition took place need to be examined. It is unsafe to rely only upon the sole testimony of the defendant and hold that there is an oral partition unless admissions are obtained from the mouth of the plaintiff saying that there is separation, katas is changed, separate tanda and the revenue is paid in to the particular portion in the possession of the plaintiff and the defendant. Then, with regard to the appreciation of the evidence of the power of attorney holder, there is some confusion because of there is some confusion because of the judgment of the Supreme Court, there is absolutely no confusion with regard to the judgment. Uh, somehow, lawyers and judicial officers appear to be under some confusion with regard to this. And that I would like to clarify right now. If the audience is not aware of the judgment, my job is lesson. If they are aware of the judgment, I have got some difficulty in telling them as to what the correct legal position in that regard is. AER 2005 Supreme Court 439. AER 2005 Supreme Court 439. Janaki Vastev Bhojwani. Janaki Vaste Bhojwani versus Indus Ind Bank. Indus Ind Bank. See, what happened in that case was you will find one of the parties to the suit was a bank. The borrower had pleaded discharge. That was not accepted by the court. The matter ultimately reached the Supreme Court at one point of time. The defendant had pleaded that he had discharged the loan. He had not entered the witness parts. His power of attorney holder was examined. The Supreme Court says it is a case where the defendant has pleaded discharge. It is for him to enter the witness parts and say that he has discharged the loan. The evidence of the power of attorney holder will not help to establish his plea. Power of attorney holder cannot give evidence in the place of the defendant. This is what the Supreme Court said in that case. In that case, the power of attorney holder cannot give evidence in the place of the defendant. In the legal fraternity, there are some confusion they thought that the Supreme Court had laid down a law saying that in no case a power of attorney holder can give evidence, either the plaintiff or the defendant should give evidence. The situation was such that when this judgment was reported, lawyers started making applications for reopening the case, relying upon this judgment for examining the plaintiff if he had if he had not been examined, his PF order was examined, or similarly in the case of the defendant. Then, as far as Karnataka is concerned, I find some lawyers from Karnataka and some judicial officers also from Karnataka. You please see 
This judgment of the Supreme Court is 6 12, 2004. Within six months thereafter, on 8 6 2005, the Karnataka High Court had an occasion to examine, to explain this decision to the legal fraternity that is in ILR 2005 Karnataka 4370. ILR 2005 Karnataka 4370, Kaju Devi versus H.S. Rudrappa. Our High Court said, Nowhere in this Janki Vasudev Bhojwani case, the Supreme Court has said that a power of attorney holder cannot be examined and in no case he can be examined is not the law laid down. In the circumstances of that case, the evidence of the power of attorney holder was of no avail to the defendant. The defendant should have stepped in. Please see the date. 6 12 2004 is the judgment of the Supreme Court. Within six months thereafter, our High Court had an occasion to examine that decision on 8-6-2005, our High Court clarified it. Then again, in ILR 2006, Karnataka 3129, ILR 2006, Karnataka 3129, Bhimappa versus Ali Saab on 27-2006, again, eight months thereafter, ILR 2006, Karnataka 3129, another honorable judge said, by referring to the provisions of the evidence that competence of witnesses 118 and all that said, any person can give evidence so long as he is aware of the facts. The Supreme Court has not laid down that in no case one of the power of attorney holders evidence could be accepted. You must also note one thing here. The decision in ILR 2006 Karnataka 3129 by then, the decision in ILR 2005 Karnataka 4370 had already been reported and the matter was also decided. That decision was not cited. What I am trying to tell is two independent minds came to the same conclusion, uninfluenced by each other's judgment, and they interpreted the judgment of the Supreme Court. The matter did not rest there. Another single judge in AER 2007 Karnataka 70. AR 2007, Karnataka 17, Shardamma versus Kenchamma on 8 8 2006. See the dates here. 23, uh, 6 12, 2004 is the judgment of the Supreme Court. High Court judgment 8 6 2005. Next High Court judgment 27 2 2006. Six months thereafter on 8 8 2006. Another judge. This single judge also did not refer to ILR 2006 or ILR 2005. His lordship also put this in view. What does it mean? Three independent minds without referring to the because by the time AR 2007 was reported, the other two decisions were already there. They were not cited. All the three learned judges have examined the ratio given in the Supreme Court decision and have said, well, the Supreme Court has nowhere said that a power of attorney holder cannot enter the witness box or his evidence cannot be accepted. Then, Honorable Justice R. V. Ravindran had an occasion to examine this legal position in great detail. And as his lordship is known for that clarity, in Mankaur, M A N K A U R, Mankaur versus Hartar Singh Sandha, Mankaur versus Hartar Singh Sandha, reported in 2010, Volume 10, SCC 512. 2010, Volume 10, SCC 512, explained the legal position in very clear terms. I have told you on a number of occasions, whenever a legal position is examined by his lordship, he would summarize the entire legal position in the penultimate para or the last para of his judgment so that the legal fraternity need not read the entire judgment. So in para 18 of this judgment, his lordship has put in very clear terms. We may now summarize for convenience the position as to who should give evidence in regard to matters involving personal knowledge. Uh, some seven situations have been conceived. Uh, there is no time for me to read it. I will just explain this with one or two illustrations. <clears throat> of course, on some platforms, I have taken my own personal uh, uh, situation. Let me not do that. You see, a property is purchased by a government servant or he owns a property. 
he wants to dispose of that property or he wants to let out that property to someone. The property is in village X. He is working in place Y. He can't frequently come to the place X and negotiate for sale at least. He gives a power of attorney to his brother, father, mother, sister, wife or whoever he or she is in the village to look for the tenants, to find out the intending buyers, to enter into an agreement of sale, to enter into a lease deal, collect rents and all that. Right. It is he acting on that power of attorney enters into that sale transaction, lease transaction. He has personal knowledge of what transpired, how much advance was paid. He knows it. What does this X, uh, what does this man, the owner of the property working in place yet, know as to what actually transpired between his power of attorney holder and the defendant or the plaintiff as the case may be? This is an ideal case where the evidence of the power of attorney holder would be the evidence of a competent person and not of the owner of the property because he has no personal knowledge at all. Except title deeds may be that barked through him, nothing more. He can't say anything about this. Then his lordship says readiness and willingness. Obviously, it is for the plaintiff to enter the witness box and speak as about it. Here again, the lordship has said, even for this, there is a recognized exception. If some power of attorney is given, uh, some person residing abroad and other things, he has given a power of attorney authorizing his father or mother to purchase some property and all that. Well, he would have approached him or she would have approached the defendant number of times with the balance sale consideration, taking relatives and friends, please execute the sale deal. The plaintiff may not have personal knowledge at all about these things. Some matrimonial disputes. The husband has treated the wife with cruelty or the wife has treated the husband with cruelty. These are not things about which a power of attorney holder can speak. It is only the spouses who can speak about it. Therefore, uh, as I said, for want of time, I am not able to read this. Though I am tempted to read, I don't read it. Please read page 523 in this judgment in 2010, volume 10, SEC 512, para 18. I am given to understand that subsequently also this judgment has been referred to by the Supreme Court. Anyway, I have not checked this. And our High Court has also uh, referred to this. Again, in ILR 2014, Karnataka 84. ILR 2014, Karnataka 84. Or Narsimha versus SP Sridhar. So, these judgments would make it very clear that the evidence of a power of attorney holder can also be accepted. Even if the plaintiff or the defendant is not examined in that case, if we can convince the court that there was nothing for the plaintiff or the defendant to enter the witness box, Every fact was known to the power of attorney holder. He was the competent person to speak. Certainly, the court should accept this. Please cite this decision. Then, evidence of this attestas. What is attestation? We find the meaning of the expression attestation in the Transfer of Property Act, some indication from the Indian Succession Act also. All that the attestor is required to depose in the court is that the document in question was executed in his presence. Of course, it goes further. Even if he has received a personal acknowledgement that is sufficient, of course, when he comes and says that it was written in my presence itself, the courts will not believe. If he says that he, has, that he received a written acknowledgement, well, theoretically it is sound, but practically it will be difficult. So he gives direct evidence of the fact that in his presence, the executed of the document affixed his thumb mark or put his signature. Questions are asked to the attestor as to who owned the property. Did you verify the title deeds? I execute a sale deed in favor of some X. Yes. Some Y is the attestor. Why should I show the title deed to that Y? Absolutely not necessary. Please avoid such questions being asked to the attestor saying, did you verify the title date? Did you go through the revenue? Others? Why is he required to do it? Unless he speaks to certain other facts. Supposing a suit for declaration of title and intention. 
he is the attestant to the gift deed or some some title deed under which the plaintiff claims or the defendant claims incidentally he also speaks about possession maybe he had an occasion to see the plaintiff being in possession or the defendant being in possession he may have a land adjacent to the suit land or he may be staying in a house if he also speaks about possession in addition to attestation cross examine him in great detail with regard to is how he came to know that the plaintiff is in possession or defendant is in possession i have already told you with regard to title any amount of oral evidence will not help the parties will not take you anywhere so this is all so if the attestor says i have not gone through the sale deed i do not know the uh, boundaries of the property that is of no consequence was he present when the executed executed the document here again a word of caution after the civil procedure code was amended in 1999/2002 examination in chief is by affidavit affidavit is filed then uh, uh, some lawyer comes and he gets the documents marked i have seen many lawyers getting the signature of the attestor only marked what is it that the attestor has to say he must say that the executant signs the document in his presence or affixed his mark so you must tell us it from him which is that signature which the defendant or the plaintiff put in his presence or someone else put in his presence what is now being done is the signature of the attestor is got mark no purpose is served the signature of the attestor may help in a case where the document is a gift or a mortgage or a will where attestation is also compulsory in other cases where attestation is not required at all of course practice is to have attestors then from the attestors mouth you will have to elicit well he was present with affidavit discloses but uh, when he is put to the witness box you don't ask him which is that signature of the defendant or the plaintiff used with you say was put in your presence even if it is got marked already through the plaintiff or the defendant as exhibit p1a or d1a you must say well exhibit p1a already marked is the signature of the defendant exhibit d1a already marked is the signature of the plaintiff something of that kind that is please take care of then with regard to this strike now the supreme court in a few decisions has held that a strike can also be an attestor in a given situation so he must sign the document not only in his capacity as a strike but also in his capacity as an attestor even in the case of strike there may not be any need for him to know the boundaries of the property and there is one thing else here he is a professional man he would have written number of documents he cannot be expected to say from his memory whether he wrote a document to which the plaintiff and the defendant were parties section 159 of the evidence act which speaks about refreshing his memory please refresh your memory by reading to section 159 of the evidence act i will simultaneously do myself also a witness may while under examination while under examination i have seen lawyers particularly in criminal cases telling it is for the prosecutor to refresh his memory outside the court not in the witness box while under examination examination not in the office of the public prosecutor or in the office of the lawyer examination in court while he is in the witness box refresh his memory by referring to what by referring to any writing made by himself any writing made by himself at the time of the transaction concerning which he is questioned well whether this plaintiff and the defendant had called you at any point of time all right was there any occasion for you or a professional strike was there any occasion for you to scribe a document well an honest scribe in my opinion should say show the document then i will tell you lawyers will understand when you are also scribes when you draft documents and when you are put to the witness box then you will say i can't be expected to remember the documents which i have all scribed unless the document is shown for you the document has to be shown to refresh his memory but for the litigant for another witness the document should not be shown oh he can't be so he is looking to the document my learned friend is putting the answer to his mouth showing the document to him he is entitled to refresh his memory how can he say it so therefore that can be perfectly permissible that can be done 
then as i said the suit is for declaration of title and injunction there is a plea of adverse possession and all that the witnesses also say a reproduction of the plain governments in the affidavit of the witness also plaintiff is the owner in possession thank god the decisions do not find a place in the uh, affidavit filed by the witnesses and uh, suit is barred by time witnesses also say in their affidavit this is the stage to which we have reached then he says that the plaintiff is the owner of the defendant is the of what consequence i have already told you there is no point in eliciting answers from the both of the witnesses as to who the owner of the property is so you can't say the opponent says he has examined pw2 nowhere in his evidence he has stated that the plaintiff is the owner why should he say it he can speak about possession then with regard to possession when the question of appreciation of evidence comes in had he an occasion to know about the plaintiff's possession he is he a neighbor does he stay in a house adjacent to the house of the plaintiff or do they stay in a tenement where he is a tenant in a particular portion the plaintiff or the defendant is a tenant in another portion he may have an occasion he may not be his neighbor he may be his close relative he occasionally goes there the land is situated in the village of x in the village x the witness stays in the village y certainly he must explain why though the land is situated in the village x he knows who is in possession he may say well i have my in-laws in that place yet i frequently go there on every sunday or monday the market takes place there i go there to buy certain things or my relatives are there my own land is there though i am from village yet i have also got a land in why i go to my land and therefore i had a vacation to city plenty for the dependent cultivating the land in which event uh, he will explain in criminal cases we said chance witness so he has to explain what was that occasion for him to know he is a neighbor he is a relative that is, that needs to be established in the chief examination itself we can bring it this is the reason why i had an occasion to know it then about this rural partition do the persons who speak about the rural partition have had personal knowledge of it is important here age becomes extremely important the partition referred to in the written statement is something which is said to have taken place about 20 or 25 years prior to the filing of the written statement here again a word of caution written statement is filed in year 2018 the affidavit of the defendant is filed in year 2022 when he enters the witness box in the written statement filed in 2018 he have stated a partition took place about 25 years back the same thing is repeated here it will not be 25 it would be 30 years please take care to see that 25 years prior to the filing of the written statement as on the date of evidence it is already 30 year old you will have to specifically say when i mean at least date may not be knowing about 28 years 30 years like this then who we are examining the partition took place according to your client about 25 years prior to the filing of the written statement was done in 2018 you examine a person today of course he is aged 50 years what was his age about 25 years a boy of 20 years or 22 years would he have been taken as a panchayat many times you would be you examine a person aged about 42 years well grown up man but what was his age a boy of 15 years when this partition took place who will take him as a panchayat then in many cases what happens is obviously in partition suits there will be number of defendants one of them dies the senior most usually dies first his lrs are brought up with that so the first lr is his wife she enters the witness box to speak about a partition that partition took place much prior to her marriage how does she know about the partition it is through her husband or someone she has knowledge of that partition she has no personal knowledge therefore no purpose should be served by examining persons who could not have had personal knowledge i am not suggesting for a moment that only aged people should be brought to speak about partition 
see the early see the date of the partition period if the exact date is not there <coughs> at least the year how old is the person who you are examining <coughs> would he have had an occasion to be present when this starts of partition took place <coughs> that becomes very material there so don't go by the age of the legal representative uh, he is the first legal representative therefore examine <coughs> maybe her brother in law husband's brother may be competent to speak about it because he knows the affairs of the family before this lady entered the matrimonial say don't mistake me that i am not condemning her she would not have a knowledge about it if something has taken place after marriage certainly she is competent to speak about this therefore number of questions are asked in his trial. he says i do not know anything obviously does not know anything he could not have known if he says that he knows that evidence cannot be taken at all then about this commissioners appointed under r26 rule line particularly in cases of encroachment the evidence of a commissioner preferably a civil engineer if it is a case of encroachment of a site or some construction put on a party wall or if it is encroachment of a land a surveyor his evidence is very material the courts would be too slow not to, to reject the evidence of the commissioner in preference to the oral evidence given by the parties in the very nature of things oral evidence cannot be given that much of weight plaintiff says encroachment is to an extent of two acres or some sense defendant says no encroachment even if 100 witnesses are examined what purpose would be sir certainly the evidence of the commissioner has to be given weight because he is an independent person unless there is something in his evidence he has not gone to this part at all he has prepared a sketch here or he has not conducted the survey in accordance with the, the survey manual he himself has no knowledge of survey certainly the evidence cannot be accepted otherwise there is no reason as to why the evidence of a commissioner for local investigation cannot be accepted his evidence is certainly preferable to the evidence of the parties it is obviously self interested and which does not serve any purpose then the next question is whether this commissioner should be examined of course it is strictly outside but it has some relevancy in the context as to how the evidence is to be appreciated order 26 rule 10 sub rule 2 says that the evidence of a commissioner appointed under order 26 rule 9 is evidence by itself it is a part of the record i am not aware of the judgments of the supreme court or of other high courts our high court has taken a view that there is no need to examine the commissioner because his report itself is evidence even without that decision one can easily say well the statute itself says it is evidence by itself there is no need to examine the commissioner there is no need to mark his report but order 26 rule 10 sub rule 2 provides if the court for any reason wants to examine the commissioner the court can summon him as his as its witness the parties can also summon him and examine him with regard to the matters referred to him the manner in which he has done the executed the commission work you will find it from the language of part 26 rule 10 therefore i repeat there is no evidence of the commissioner has to be preferred to the evidence of the parties there is no need to examine the commissioner there is no need to mark the report i am not telling he should not be examined at all he can be examined provided you want it then there is some procedural difficulty here now the report of the commissioner is in favor of the plaintiff a professional lawyer who knows the law who has read order 26 rule 10 knows that there is no need to examine the commissioner he will tell the court order 26 rule 10 says that it is evidence by itself it was not incumbent upon me to examine defendant lawyer says i have filed objections to the report of the commissioner it was my learned it was for my learned friend to examine why should you examine the plaintiff lawyer is a professional man knows the law he doesn't examine defendant can examine the commissioner and show to the court that the commission work has not been properly done his report for reasons 1 2 3 cannot be accepted 
the plaintiff doesn't summon him because he is happy with the evidence of the commissioner the report of the commissioner he can not the court to look into the commission's report without the commissioner being examined unless the defendant examines he will not be able to bring to the notice of the court what is the deficiency in the report why the report cannot be accepted so he summons him now the evidence that says he who summons him has to examine him in chief the evidence that further says that he cannot be leading questions cannot be put in the chief exam fine now the defendant is challenged in the report of the commissioner he has filed objections to the report of the commissioner unless he cross examines the commissioner he cannot convince the court where the commissioner has run has gone wrong why his report cannot be accepted what is it that can be done please go to section 154 of the evidence act which many think has a place only in a criminal case the court may in its discretion permit the person who calls a witness to put any question to him which might be put in cross examination by the adverse party the word hostile is not mentioned in section 154 but usually in a criminal case we say when the witness does not support the prosecution we call him as a hostile witness there is absolutely no bar even in a civil case to treat a witness hostile now the commissioner is summoned by the defendant himself in the record is shown as dw2 or something no he can't suddenly say something contrary to his report the defendant cannot cross examine directly put a few formal questions in the chief examination for you appointed as a commissioner in this case is this the commission warrant is this the report you have given are there the memos of inspections which both the parties filed formally get them marked then tell the court i have filed objections to the report of the commissioner unless i am permitted to cross examine the commissioner i cannot bring out the truth and in the judicial academy i have told the judicial officers this uh, concept of cross examining one's own witness is not the exclusive privilege of the public prosecutor even a plaintiff lawyer can do it and a defendant lawyer can also do it you request the court to permit you to cross examine him which can be done and 26 rule 10 also says that the court if it wants clarification can also summon him in which event it is open to both the parties to put any question then with regard to the evidence of the experts in a civil case more particularly this handwriting and the fingerprint experts of course these days the dna reports and paternity is in question here again the provisions of part 26 rule 10a which provide for site commission for scientific investigation prior to 1976 applications were filed under section 45 of the evidence act now applications are filed under 26 rule 10a read with 45 whatever be the provision there is a provision under 26 rule 10a which says that the provisions of relating to commission for local investigation under 26 rule 9 apply mutatis mutandis to a commissioner appointed in rule 10a also what does it mean that even an expert need not be examined we have a judgment of justice n kumar on this point in this context uh, anyway the audience from is from different states i have also right now i am not able to give you the decision now there is no need to examine an expert if the parties want they can examine if the court wants they can examine same thing as in the case of a commissioner for local investigation then the question is as between the evidence of the expert and the oral evidence of a witness which needs to be preferred you will find section 45 under that head which says opinion evidence he gives opinion evidence in my opinion the signature on the disputed document is not of the plaintiff it is not of the defendant he doesn't say it is of so and so he doesn't give a positive report he rules out the possibility of the two signatures being similar or being not similar in my opinion because i have conducted this test i am of the opinion that those signatures are similar exhibit p1a the disputed signature is similar to the admitted signature or specimen signatures are not similar now let us take a case 
we have a gift deed. Plaintiff relies upon a gift deed. Defendant disputes it. We will take it. It is the defendant, according to the plaintiff, it is the defendant who has executed the gift deed. There is a specific denial of the gift deed by the defendant in the written statement. Specific denial in the manner contemplated by Order 8, which I took a lot of pains on the other occasion to tell how the uh, denial should be. It is in this background. Please go to section 68 of the Evidence Act. Please look to it very carefully. If a document is required by law to be attested, it shall not be used as evidence until one attesting witness at least has been called for the purpose of proving its execution. If there be an attesting witness alive and subject to the process of the court and capable of giving evidence. So if a document requires attestation, it's, it can be proved by examining attesting witness. Let us read the proviso. Provided that it shall not be necessary to call an attesting witness in proof of the execution of any document not being able, which has been registered in accordance with the provisions of the Indian Registration Act, unless its execution by the person by whom it purports to have been executed is specifically denied. Now, the defend, according to the plaintiff, it is the defendant who has executed the gift deed in his favor. The defendant in the written statement specifically denies the execution of the document. Plaintiff has to prove its execution by examining at least one attesting witness. Plaintiff examines one attesting witness or both the attesting witnesses. They fully support the case of the plaintiff. Despite searching cross examination, nothing can be brought on record to discredit their testimony. So the defendant client is fully convinced. Well, the attestors have stood the test of cross examination. It has become difficult for me to dislodge them. Then he takes a chance of getting the document examined through an expert. Application is filed, the application is allowed, expert is appointed. The expert, in his opinion, in his opinion, not those words, it is only opinion. The expert was not present when the document was executed. Please know that. The expert, he has got some parameters. He says, well, the signature exhibit P1A on the gift deed, which is the disputed signature, is not similar to the signature of the defendant. I don't find them to be similar. So the report or the opinion of the expert is in favor of the defendant. The evidence of the attesting witnesses is in favor of the plaintiff. What is to be done? The legal position is direct evidence or ocular evidence given in court, be it a civil case or a criminal case, has to be accepted and not the opinion of the expert. Please be clear about this. Therefore, the court will be well justified in accepting the evidence of the attesting witnesses and uphold the gift. Don't find fault with the trial judge who says, hey, in spite of the expert's opinion, the trial judge does not know the basics of the evidence that he has ignored the report of the expert. Well, judicial officers have been trained in judicial academy. Most of them, of course, new entrants may have some difficulty. Most of them know the law. Please don't underestimate them any longer. Therefore, an expert's opinion is only opinion evidence. Because he might not have also come to a direct conclusion. So this is one important. It might happen in any other case. Now that I am on the aspect of this uh, examining and attesting witness, let me slightly deviate here. I read out to you the main part of section 68, which says, if a document requires attestation, it shall not be used in evidence unless one attesting witness is examined. The proviso says it is not necessary to examine the attesting witness if the execution is not specifically denied by the person who is said to have executed it. This is very important. The example which I gave was a case where the, according to the plaintiff, the defendant had executed the gift. Defendant has denied its execution specifically. Certainly, the plaintiff has to examine the attesting witness, failing which the court cannot rely upon this gift at all. 
Let me take another case. Plaintiff says that one yet he is not a party to the suit. One yet has executed a gift deed in his favor. Therefore, he has become the owner. The defendant, who is a total stranger, is denying his title. Defendant formally denies. No, it is false to say that uh, the that so and so yet has executed a gift deed in his favor. That yet the donor, the person who is said to have gifted the property to the plaintiff. Enters the witness box and deposes in favor of the plaintiff, saying, "Well, this exhibit P1 is a document executed by me. Exhibit P1A is my signature." Nothing is brought out in this cross examination to you tell her that I was being patient or patient. Nothing. Tomorrow I am telling you tell. Her. There is nothing to disbelieve. Therefore, she, the lawyer argues, the defendant client. The defendant client argues, plaintiff has not examined the attesting witness. I have denied its execution. He reads out section 68 only the main part and says, "Well, this is an attest. This is a document which requires compulsory attestation. The plaintiff has not chosen to examine the attesting witness. When the examination of the attesting witness becomes material, when the person who is purported to have executed specifically denies it." The donor PW2 has not denied. He comes and gives evidence in favor of the plaintiff. Where is any need for the plaintiff to examine the attesting witness? On the other hand, if it is the case of the plaintiff that it is the defendant who executed the document and the defendant denies execution, certainly the plaintiff has to examine the attesting witness. In the same case, let us say that uh, X, who is said to have executed the gift deed, does not depose in favor of the plaintiff. He doesn't. He gives evidence in favor of the defendant. He gives evidence in favor of the defendant. Certainly, the plaintiff has to examine the attesting witness because the person who is purported to have executed the document specifically denies its execution. Well, he comes. This is not my signature. I have not executed any document. Then, Mr. Vitas Chetrat, have I got another fifteen minutes time? Mr. Vitas. Yes, sir. Yes. Now I have given some concepts. Before I close, I want to uh, tell about appreciation of evidence in particular suits. I am taking up a few suits which are commonly uh, filed in the trial courts. Money suits. If it is based on a pronote, if the execution of the pronote is denied, well, as I have already told you, plaintiff needs to prove only execution. He need not prove the passing of consideration. It is for the defendant in your the presumption under section 118 to prove the negative saying. That consideration has not passed up. So is the case if the suit is based on a check, it is dishonored. Then the consideration mentioned in the document is filax. Defendant says, Well, I have executed the document, but the money paid to me, the consideration which was passed on to me was not five lakhs, but only two lakhs. Defendant take it, he has admitted the execution of the document. Therefore, it is for the defendant to show that what passed on to him under the document was only 2 lakhs and not 5 lakhs. Then he says, well, I have executed the document. I have received money, but I have repaid everything. So he pleads discharge. The legal position is settled that he who pleads discharge has to establish it. Then take a suit for recovery of rent. Relationship of landlord and tenant is admitted. Rate of rent is admitted. Defendant says, I have paid every rent for all months. Nothing is due. Then it is for the defendant to establish that he has paid the rent because he who pleads discharge. 
Supposing the relationship of landlord and tenant is denied, you have to be careful here appearing for the plaintiff. Defendant in the written statement says, I am not a tenant under the plaintiff. There is no dual relationship of landlord and tenant between me and the plaintiff. Then the defendant lawyer argues and tells the court, my learned friend has to file a separate suit and get a declaration about this dual relationship now. In this very suit which is filed for recovery of rent, the first issue is whether the plaintiff proves the existence of that relationship of landlord and tenant as between him and the defendant. Then, if the relationship is denied, the plaintiff takes that burden. Then, a rate of rent is denied. Plaintiff says the rate of rent is 25,000. Defendant says that the rate of rent is 20,000. Here, the plaintiff has to prove that the rate of rent is 25,000. Now, well, again, we have said preponderance of probabilities. Uh, well, the court has to either accept the case of the plaintiff as 25,000 or the case of the defendant. The court cannot draw an average as in a low total and say 22,500. No. The court has to either accept the case of the plaintiff or accept the case of the defendant. First, if there are rent receipts, the pro or rent agreement, the problem is, or the plaintiff may examine another tenant in the same tenement which has the same dimension. He says, I am also paying 25,000. Or the defendant may examine another tenant. No. My, my, my house and the house of the defendant, uh, they are of similar dimensions. Everything is same. I am paying only 20,000 because it is only oral evidence. Then in the suit for specific performance, see whether the agreement is denied totally or the signature is admitted and only certain circumstances are pleaded. I said it is only a loan transaction. Here there is no need to prove the execution of the document. First of all, an agreement of sale did not be in writing. It could be oral. Even if it is in writing, it does not require registration. Third, it does not require attestation. And therefore, there is no need to examine the attesting witness. But if the evidence discloses that both the attesting witnesses are alive, you cannot take a foolhardy risk of not examining the attesting witnesses who would give direct evidence and examine someone else. Though the evidence act does not say if a document does not require attestation, even then, if the attesting witnesses are alive, they should be. It doesn't say so. But practical considerations are there. Document certainly does not require attestation. But it is brought out in the cross examination that the attesting witnesses are alive. Instead of examining them, relying upon that abstract proposition, a document which does not require attestation can be proved by other evidence. It is a risk that you are taking. Why you are not examining the attesting witnesses who are available, available and alive? That has to be examined. Then a plea is taken that time was of the essence of the contract. In the case of immobile property, the presumption is that time is not of the essence of the contract. Of course, there is a thinking uh, about uh, a, a relook or revisiting this required in this context. As of now, the law is time is not of the essence of the contract in the case of an immobile property. Therefore, if the defendant pleads that time was of the essence of the contract, the burden is on him. Then, despite the amendment brought to Section 16 by the recent amendment, the need to establish readiness and willingness is still there. Plaintiff need not hour in the plaint that he was always ready and willing to perform his part of the contract, but he has still to establish that. Then, of course, whether what is the effect of the deletion of Section 20, substitution of Section 20, that's a different aspect of the matter. Assuming that there is a case which relates to an agreement which was executed prior to the amendment, recently the Supreme Court has said if it is a suit for specific, if it is a suit for specific performance in relation to an agreement which came into existence prior to the amendment, oh, you can't apply the new act. So Supreme Court has also said under Section 20, hardship has to be pleaded by the defendant. Then in the case of suits for injunction, if it is an agricultural land or a building, proving possession is easy. Some neighbors can be examined. In the case of agricultural lands, RTC, that is revenue records would be there. In the case of building also, Tata would be there or neighbors can be examined. The difficulty arises in the case of a house site because no evidence of actual possession can be given. There the presumption 
that possession follows title will have to be applied there in such situations. Though the suit is for intention, incidentally, the plaintiff has to establish his title if it is a suit in respect of a vacant site because there is no way by which actual possession can be established. Uh, maybe a year back or two years back when I spoke about trial of suits for declaration of title, intention and possession, I have drawn the attention of the audience to the judgment of Justice uh, Kravindran in Anatullah versus, Anatullah Sudhakar versus Bucci Reddy. Please read that judgment. It will be really an enlightening judgment. Then, in a suit for mandatory intention, pleading encroachment, better get a commissioner appointed. I have already told you that the evidence and the report of the commissioner cannot be lightly ignored. In the case of declaration of title, intention and possession, title cannot be proved by examining any number of witnesses unless it is a case of adverse possession. And the basis of the title will have to be clearly pleaded. If the title of the plaintiff's vendor is also denied, plaintiff should examine how his vendor got title. Then plea of adverse possession by the defendant. Then there is one concept called just tertiary. Defendant does not admit that plaintiff is the owner. He does not say that he is the owner. He says that someone else is the owner. Plaintiff says he is the owner. Defendant does not admit that the plaintiff is the owner. He does not say that he is the owner. He says that someone else is the owner. This is called a plea of just tertiary, setting up title in others. So here is a case where the defendant says that the property belongs to someone else. Certainly the burden is on him because the plaintiff would have produced some documents probabilizing his title. Then, when the, as I have already said, when the title of the vendor is denied, it is necessary to show as to how the plaintiff's vendor got title. Then, uh, suits for partition, when the relationship is admitted, there is no problem. When the relationship is not admitted, you will have to give that evidence which has been declared to be relevant under Section 50 of the Evidence Act. Evidence of persons who would have known about the relationship. You go to your friend's house. Your friend introduces from X and Y sitting there as his parents. You have frequently gone there. You will just accept it. You have not attended the plaintiff's marriage. You have not attended their nothing. But you just plaintiff introduces some woman in his house as his spouse. You will accept it. This is called opinion evidence. If there are documents, some adoption deeds, school records, medical records showing the names of the persons, how they are related, fine. Otherwise, oral evidence as covered by section 50. And uh, I don't know the practice elsewhere in the country, but in our state, there is the practice of producing a genealogy in suits for partition as though it is a very valuable piece of evidence to establish genealogy. Lawyers know and judicial officers know what is this genealogy. Plaintiff before he files the suit for partition goes to the revenue inspector or the village accountant and tells that A was his father, B was his grandfather, C was his great grandfather. E, D, E, E, F, G are his brothers and sisters. And the village accountant or the revenue inspector makes a note there. So, uh, before me, he has stated so. Instead of this plaintiff going to that village accountant and revenue ask, uh, inspector swearing before him, let him swear before the court saying that this is the relationship. That genealogy which you are producing in a partition suit is useful to the court only to know what the genealogy is. It is not proof of genealogy. It is not proof of genealogy at all. See, there is a death register, birth register. They are all public documents. Certainly, the, those extracts would be relevant. They are admissible in evidence. This genealogy has absolutely nothing. The plaintiff goes and tells that village accountant, this is my genealogy. He is my brother. He is my father. It has absolutely no evidentiary value. It only helps the court. We can instead of producing that genealogy which is illegible, you can put it, uh, you can type it and give it in the plaint itself, put that genealogy in it. 
then this is contained and uh, your case in a suit for partition should be very clear is it an ancestral property is it a joint family property or is it a property which the parties or plaintiff is claiming as belonging to his father or as belonging to his mother please see to whom the property let there not be vague pleadings uh, saying that it is ancestral producing some documents admitting in cross examination they are self accusations that will not take you anywhere so then lastly how to present the case before the court now i have told you that the evidence act by section 5 has declared has said i have already declared through section 6 to 55 which are those facts are relevant i have i also injured the court from receiving any fact which i have not declared as relevant therefore when you present the case a read only relevant portions of the pleading don't start reading the entire plaint or the written statement a read only the relevant portions of the depositions then it is not just reading the deposition that is sufficient you will have to tell the court why the evidence of a particular witness cannot be believed or can be believed you examine pw2 to prove the execution of a document you will draw the attention of the court exhibit p1 is this disputed document it shows the name of pw2 and one x as its attestors i have chosen to examine pw2 he has stated in the chief examination that in his presence the defendant executed this document in the cross examination this is what is elicited who was there who are all there what was the color of the shirt which he was wearing where he was sitting all unnecessary details as in a criminal even in a criminal case such uh, cross examination is of no use obviously of no use in a civil case so therefore please read only the relevant portions and tell the court as to why that evidence if you are appearing for the plaintiff or appearing for the defendant relying upon the evidence of a witness to prove a particular fact attestation of the document execution of the document relationship of the parties possession you read the deposition highlight only relevant portions in the cross examination and sometimes suggestions are made denials are obtained it is absolutely of no evidentiary value suggestions have to be made otherwise you will be accept in the version given in the chief examination i have suggested he has denied finish it is of no consequence if it is an admission it is of some consequence so you will have to tell the court why the evidence of a particular witness can be believed or cannot be believed and then don't just read the depositions in the order in which it is recorded in the court the first issue relates to title who are the witnesses who can speak about title which are the documents which are relevant to prove that first issue take only those documents take only those exhibits draw the attention of the court the evidence of the attesting witness is material draw the attention of the court to his evidence only don't read the evidence of pw3 when you are arguing about issue number 1 which relates to title issue number 2 is with regard to possession there the evidence of pw3 may be material partition suit first issue is with regard to relationship itself why should you read some rtc extracts which show whether the properties are joint family properties or the self acquisitions so when you argue also refer only to relevant portions of the pleadings and depositions so with this i have done i believe i have told things only relevant to the subject under discussion and i am done if there are any questions welcome not with reference to any pending case i am making it very clear let i am not giving any opinion in respect of any pending case i have ceased to be a lawyer i don't do it i have still connections with the judiciary and it is improper for me to give any opinion to a lawyer in respect of a pending case if you have got any doubt with regard to this of course in that case you may uh, uh, seek some clarification for a pending case i am helpless but don't tell me the facts of the pending case or a case which you propose to uh, file no that i can't do i have ceased to be a judicial officer still i have maintained the ethics and propriety i don't want to give any advice to a lawyer in respect of a suit pending or a suit contemplated or a suit disposed of 
Yes. Well, this is what is the difference between a marking a document and exhibiting it? Are there into uh, different things mutually inclusive or exclusive? The question is this: the exhibiting means showing the document to the witness and the court saying this is a particular document. This is a CD. You are exhibiting it. Then the court, for purposes of its convenience, gives a number: P one, P two. If the plaintiff has produced it, number of documents he has produced. Therefore, marking only means for purposes of identification, the number is given. In Karnataka, we say P one, P two. In Northern India, they don't say it as one, two, three. They will just say P like this, or exhibit one itself. So it is only for the purpose of convenience. Proof is different. Proof in the manner contemplated by the evidence side. How a document is required, certification is to be proved, and all that. Then, uh, witness has deposed orally, and who is called by plaintiff doesn't provide any documentary or. Corroborative material. What is the extent the court shall rely on such an evidence? As I have already told you, in respect of title, absolutely no purpose would be served by examining uh, number of witnesses who give oral evidence to title. There should be a document in support of the case of the plaintiff or the defendant if it's a question of title. Of course, whether the document requires registration, what is the evidentiary value? Whether it is admissible in evidence, they are all a different aspect of the matter. There should necessarily be a document. If it is an oral partition, if it is a case of possession, plaintiff is in possession or defendant is in possession, or if it is a case of adverse possession, certainly oral evidence would be material. Even in the case of relationship, some villagers, illiterate persons, they are not gone to school. There are no school records. They are not reported the birth or death to the authorities concerned. Well, some close relatives may come. And give evidence, oral evidence with regard to relationship. It all depends on how ultimately he has fared well in the cross examination. I project myself as to know a particular X. I come on to give evidence. I know X. He is the son of Y. In the cross examination, I say I do not know the names of the sisters of X. I do not know the name of the mother of X. I do not know where their house is. How my evidence can be accepted? So it depends on what is elicited in the cross examination. That comes by experience. Uh, how to cross-examine a witness and all that, uh, and I am not myself good at that because I used to be a lawyer in the year 1985. I am only appreciating evidence. I am not leading evidence in any case, and therefore, uh, uh, to advise a lawyer in the matter of cross-examination, I must honestly confess I am not good at that. But with my experience, I can tell whether uh, what is elicited in the cross-examination. Is sufficient or insufficient? And I don't believe in a class under the head art of cross examination. It has to come on its own. No amount of coaching can help in that regard. You will have to be present in the court, watch the seniors cross examining. Of course, learned seniors who have a good number of cases, you will have to watch there. Just don't go by their age. See whether he has got number of cases, how learned he is, how effective his cross is. Read the judgments. Read the judgments. And then you will know how the court has appreciated evidence. What should have been the evidence given in this case? Then by that, juniors will come to know as to what is to be. In fact, when I was a junior, a lawyer told me it is cross examination which is easy because you can put any question. In the chief examination, you have got restrictions because you can't put leading questions and all that. Well, it was his experience. Uh, he said it. It comes by experience. Yes. Next question. Uh, uh, One plaintiff deposes, yes. deposes on behalf of the other plaintiffs. Will the court call other plaintiffs to give evidence or excuse them? It depends upon the facts of each case. Whether the case of both the plaintiffs is the same, on same set of facts, both of them have come to. Usually, it happens in the case of plaintiffs. Generally, there would not be conflict of interest between the plaintiffs in the same. Maybe the evidence of one plaintiff would be sufficient, but there are certain exceptions. Now this takes us to the provisions of Order One and Order Two CPC. I can't give go into detail. They, in effect, they give the situation. If different persons have similar causes of action against the same person, they can bring a common suit. I'll just give some one example. 
an agricultural land is converted into sites. The landowner has sold those sites to various persons. Let us say A and B. He denies their title or does not deliver possession or interferes with their possession. This A and B can bring a common suit. But A's declaration of title or injunction has to be confined only to item number one. B is the second plaintiff. He seeks declaration only in respect of item number two, separate court fee and all that. Here, order two provides for such a suit being filed. Order one provides for a joiner of parties in such a situation. There, the position may be different. Uh, well, the defendant might admit the title of the first plaintiff. He may deny the title of the second defendant. Or there is nothing in the cross examination of the plaintiff, first plaintiff, or the first plaintiff might have admitted everything because the first plaintiff is not able to show his possession. You can say that I rely only upon the evidence of the first plaintiff. So, evidence of the second plaintiff may also be necessary. Normally, it doesn't happen. Normally, as between the plaintiffs or amongst the plaintiffs, there would not be conflict of interest. Cases are rare. But amongst the defendants, there would be that conflict of interest. Depending upon the case, whether the evidence of a particular plaintiff can be accepted as the evidence on behalf of us, certainly that could be done. Uh, in family court, is it necessary to get compared voice of the wife and husband in the cases of all call con conversations between husband and wife in divorce case? Is submitted in the normally in the family matters, it is the spouses who know what has actually happened between them. It is not a case of 304B IPC where the victim is not available or alive to give evidence. Necessarily, the court has to rely upon the evidence of her parents or dying declaration. But in family matters where they see the divorce and other things, where cruelty and other factors are pleaded, uh, some dispute, some problem with regard to physical relationship and all that, necessarily the evidence of the parties would be uh, there. I am not able to give the exact provision the family court said. It says that the court can insist on the presence of the parties also in family matters. Even in order 3 CPC, it is there. In order 3 CPC also, though it says that a power of attorney order can be examined, the court may in its discretion call upon, I think, uh, somewhere in order 3, it is stated. Provided that any such appearance shall the court so directs be made by the party in person. So normally it is advisable in family matters to examine the parties themselves. Are there any grounds for specific performance where it can be dismissed at the stage of institution? At this uh, institution. Well, as far as I am concerned, uh, the question is. Now there is a present trend of filing applications under Order 7, Rule 11 for rejection of the client. Client can be rejected only in that six or seven situations provided in Order 7, Rule 11. The most frequently invoked are 7, Rule 11A and 7, Rule 11D. When the client does not disclose of a cause of action or when an government made in the client, the suit appears to be barred by any law. Very rarely such situations arise. Uh, therefore, the court will have to be too slow in dismissing the suit or in reject. In the extreme case where the plaintiff has no cause of action at all, if a, a daughter or a son or a wife files a suit against a man who is living for partition, anticipating that he would die soon and they would get a share. No, so that cannot be done. Plaintiff is liable to be rejected then and there. When an accused contends that he borrowed an amount lesser than the amount shown in the check, can, can you section be, 19... Can you be a little... Uh, I'm not... Uh, I did not catch the question. I am also seeing that there is some echo. Yes. When an accused contends that he borrowed an amount lesser than the amount shown in the check, can yes. the provisions of section 91 and 92 be applied against him? I will already examine that, but anyway, uh, today's subject is appreciation of evidence in civil cases. Uh, we are speaking of a case under 138 of the NI Act. Uh, well, I am not in touch with the recent decisions under 138. Maybe it requires some examination. I can't uh, straight away give an answer for it. Uh, 
could you clarify when the defendant denies the jural relationship in rent cases what can be done when the defendant denies the jural relationship in rent matters certainly the court which is required to give a decree or dismiss the suit has to examine whether the jural relationship exists the plaintiff cannot be driven to a separate suit to establish the jural relationship the first issue is whether the plaintiff proves the existence of jural relationship whether he proves that the rate of rent of course that once the jural relationship is denied obviously the defendant cannot say that that is not the rate of rent i have paid the entire rent certainly the suit deserves to be decreed so the evidence which the plaintiff has to give is if there is a rent agreement well and good if there is no rent agreement rent receipts if neither of them is available maybe oral evidence of neighbors very difficult to prove that but here again there is one thing under 114 of the evidence act it says regard being had to the common course of natural events human contact public and private business the court may presume the existence of such facts may presume now i will give a simple example plaintiff says that the defendant is his tenant he is its eviction or rent defendant admits his occupation he denies that he is a tenant when the defendant denies tenant he should say in what capacity is in possession of that property is he in possession under agreement of sale executed by the plaintiff is he is a licensee under the plaintiff or is the property is ancestral property if he simply says that i am not a tenant and the possession is proved or admitted what is the inference that can be drawn a person can be in possession of a property either as a owner or as a tenant or as a mortgagee or in an agreement of sale in all those situations some document is required to prove an oral tenancy obviously there cannot be a document common sense would tell you are in possession you don't claim ownership you don't dispute plaintiff's ownership the only inference that can that can be drawn is that you are in possession as a tenant 114 of the evidence act says regard being had to the common course of natural events human contact public and private business so there are good number of illustrations both in relation to criminal cases and civil cases uh, well we can urge the court to draw the presumption it is a discretionary presumption a judge who has that who has exercise of sound discretion has to necessarily accept your argument this is what is the evaluation to invoke pecuniary jurisdiction in a partition suit is it the value of the plaintiff share or the whole property share depends upon uh, the local court fees and suits valuation act i am not aware of the provisions of the court fees act of other states i am only aware of the provisions of the karnataka court fees and suits valuation act with regard to partition section 37 of the tamil nadu court fees and suits valuation act is in pari materia with section 35 of the karnataka act now it says in a partition suit if the plaintiff says that he is in joint possession and enjoyment the court has to simply accept it and permit him to pay court fee as provided in 35 to the maximum is 200 there are similar provision under the tamil nadu court if the plaintiff himself says that he is excluded from possession then the court fee has to be paid under 35 depending upon the market value here again is one thing if it is an urban property actual market value under the karnataka court fees and suits valuation act if it is an agricultural land depending upon the land revenue the land of times the land revenue not that then on the plaintiff's share it is on the plaintiff's share 351 and 352 they both speak of plaintiff's share with regard to pecuniary jurisdiction also the same on the plaintiff's share uh, and yes of course the local enactment makes some uh, difference this is sale deed has been executed and gpa entitled uh, and can gpa be entitled to register the property next day in case of the death of the principal whether it is uh, no, no nothing if he dies nothing the property the power of attorney goes with his death with the death of the principal no yeah now what is the difference between the rejection of a plaint and a dismissal of a suit 
rejection of a plaint is covered by order 7 rule 11 only in that six or seven contingencies as i said the main important are a and d where it does not disclose a cause of action or where the suit appears to be barred by any law from an government made dismissal it happens in several situations when the plaintiff does not turn up for default the suit is dismissed if the plaintiff abandons the claim the suit is dismissed under rule 23 rule 1 or on merits the court finds that so after dismissal a decree is drawn of course order 7 rule 11 also says rejection of the plaint amounts to a decree for rejecting the plaint under order 7 rule 11 no issue need be framed no evidence need be given only the plaint alone has to be looked into of course the supreme court has said some documents produced by the plaintiff also can be looked into no question of looking to the written statement no question of looking to the defense of the defendant if it is rejection of the plaint under order 7 rule 11 rejection is contemplated by order 7 dismissal is contemplated by order 20 after contest default order 9 7 9 and 20 of course 23 also contemplates dismissal if the plaintiff abandons the suit abandonment simply withdraws simply seated 23 rule if the plaintiff has got an ex parte order by showing a forged uh, general power of attorney by impersonation in a lower court does it amount to perjury it is likely if it is a forged document certainly the plaintiff is liable to be prosecuted under the relevant provisions of the indian penal code following the relevant provisions of crpc 195 crpc 342 345 or 6 those provisions will have to be ignored it is certainly a fit case where the court also does it and the attention of the court is also drawn to those provisions if on a forged document let alone a power of attorney any forged document the plaintiff or the defendant is liable to be proceeded against under the relevant provisions of the indian penal code i am right now not able to give you the exact sections of the indian penal code so the last question what is the difference between a disposal of a suit and dismissal of a suit disposal of a suit so disposal it has got several modes of disposal in fact uh, here again justice r v ravindran in one judgment has said which are the various modes by which a suit gets disposed of order 7 rule 11 plaint is rejected suit is disposed of then order 9 when the suit is dis- uh, dismissed for non prosecution 23 rule 1 when the plaint suit is abandoned or suit is withdrawn with liberty to file a fresh suit again under 23 compromise by judgment so disposal of a suit is that so and dismissal in particular on merits also it could be dismissed by default also it can go by withdrawal simplicity it can go So I think. Yes. Anything else? Uh, on the WhatsApp, the, uh, on the chat box, there is none. I'm just checking it out on the YouTube because yes, mainly yes. we have taken from the uh, website. This is can a Xerox copy of the will uh, or a gift deed be uh, led into evidence if the original is lost? Well, Section 65 of the Evidence Act provides. as to when secondary evidence has to be given foundation has to be laid in the witness box as to what has happened to the original of course in the cross examination it is open to the opponent to show that the original is really not lost or destroyed deliberately the plaintiff or the defendant is suppressing it but foundation has to be laid by the party who lead secondary evidence as to what has happened to the original that is provided by section 65 of the evidence act Some such six or seven situations are contemplated where secondary evidence can be let in. Yes, sir. So uh, thank you for sharing your insights. And uh, on behalf of the team of Beyond Law CLC, we would like to share that we have got the highest views on the YouTube for today's session of so many. We have done more than five fifty, but today it has garnered the maximum views online. Uh, so congratulations for sharing your knowledge thank and. You. Uh, thank you to all the participants who have been encouraging us and encouraging the speakers to bring the best speakers but if you kindly like subscribe and share that will also encourage the speakers 
to bring there and share their more knowledge. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Namaskar. And, uh, my special thanks to two judicial officers from Karnataka. I don't want to name them and cause embarrassment to them. I had to send links to them. And of course, to one of them, I sent the link. Usually, uh, I thought that I should send a link to her also because I find to be a good judicial officer. Today morning, I included her name also in the list of uh, the officers to whom I am sending the link. The other officer, he, he usually sits here. I am seeing their faces here. My special thanks to both of them. And to my knowledge, both of them are good, honest, and hardworking judicial officers. I hope that they would continue to be so. Thank you.